So good morning. Today uh, we present a webinar. Uh, the, the title you can see on the screen: Investigation of the Critical Actors in the Collaborative Ecosystem. This webinar is uh, a 4.0 uh, webinar, and I will give a little presentation, and then I will leave the floor to Masa uh, Norina Yaki, which is the first presenter of today. Uh, so the partnership for the organization of innovation 4.0 was created in in 20. 17. Uh, the team brings together professors from Canadian, American, French, Italian, and English universities, in addition to partners from different backgrounds, government, private companies, innovation intermediaries, association, etc. So team members study innovative collaborative ecosystem through multidisciplinary and cross-sectoral approaches. The overarching goal of 4.0 is to evaluate innovation ecosystem models. One of the objective is also to portray past and current collaboration model because collaboration is one of the engine of innovation. And the webinar of today is a perfect example of one of the possible output of uh, 4.0, the partnership of 4.0. So today, the study uh, that is presented examines the effect of critical actors in the collaborative ecosystem using IE related publication, patent information, and various other sources. So I will present the, uh, the main presenter of today and uh, two other discussants. So Masa, I'm not sure I pronounce well, but Masa Norina Yafi which is a PhD student in information, uh, in information system engineering at Concordia University. Her thesis focus on the stimulation on, on the simulation of dynamic process in complex environment. Then Andrea Shifarova, which is professor at Concordia Institute for Information System Engineering. Her area of expertise encompass management of science and technology Sciencometric and economics of innovation. Her current research involves using artificial intelligence and big data analytics to explore innovation ecosystem. And then the partner of this uh, of this uh, research, which is Dr. Ashkan Ebadi, uh, it's a senior research officer at the National Research Council of Canada. He is a multidisciplinary applied data science researcher with expertise in artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, and graph analytics. Um, so for me, it's a little presentation of our three discussion today. So I will leave the floor to uh, Masa. Thank you. Okay, so I can start the presentation now. Perfect. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Mahsa. I'm a PhD student at Concordia University under the supervision of Dr. Shifarova and Dr. Ebadi. And today I will discuss the investigation of the critical actors in the collaborative ecosystem. Here is the agenda we follow in the rest of the presentation. And for the introduction section, I have brought a few important uh, definitions uh, which are related to our uh, topics and which are good to know. So the, the first of all, uh, I want to explain what is the innovation system. In most of the studies and the literature review, the innovation systems and the definitions of uh, innovation has come by the concepts like the diffusion, applying and um, creation knowledge. And then uh, we go through the knowledge creation network. Uh, this knowledge creation network is uh, when the individuals and the entities or organization are collaborating with each other, with each other or um, they have some interaction to exchange the knowledge. So they created a dynamical social network of collaboration and we name it a knowledge creation network. 
And uh, analyzing this knowledge network structure um, could be very helpful and um, we can detect the important factors on its productivity and uh, finding uh, in its productivity. And also uh, the critical, there are some nodes who place um, some critical um, or significant uh, impact on uh, these networks productivity and they play uh, important roles in this network. It, uh, they could uh, play some positive impact or negative impact on its productivity. Here is the objectives we follow in the in this study, identifying these critical actors in the scientific network and then categorize them, understand their behavior in terms of their collaboration pattern or determining their tendency uh, to collaborate with the other groups of the critical actors, and also investigating their importance within the uh, ecosystem and uh, their collaboration with the other actors. And finally, uh, predict the future performance of this ecosystem. And uh, here you see uh, the overview or the overall picture of this network. Uh, you see that the nodes uh, are the authors and the edges among them are their collaboration. And uh, these dark blue nodes are the ordinary authors and uh, the other colors um, are the critical actors. And uh, these, for example, these um, green color uh, are the embedded scientists and uh, who prefer to collaborate in a cluster or those um, yellow nodes are the loyal scientists who prefer to collaborate with their previous partners and you see that they have a higher rate and um, that the widgets among them uh, has the higher rate in, um, in comparison to the other edges in the network and the gatekeeper is that orange uh, color nodes uh, who uh, connect different individuals or groups of the scientists together and uh, in the right bottom uh, that light color uh, node star scientists uh, they have the highest um, numbers of collaboration in the network and uh, about the gatekeepers uh, i have to mention that we measure it by uh, the between the centrality in the network and the between the centrality means measure all the shortest paths between every pairs of the nodes and we count how many times a node is on a shortest path between uh, two others and uh, the highest between the centrality in the network um, are refers to the gatekeepers and uh, based on the literature review uh, there there were too many studies uh, behind these critical actors and they believe that they act as the intermediaries or brokers uh, in the knowledge transfer um, circulation and also the merging uh, the diverse idea within the network because they're connecting um, the entities or different individuals together so they're gener they are generating novelty within the network and um, most of the studies believe that they have high impact on the network productivity and here is the a star scientist uh, that in this study we measure them by uh, the number of edges or collaborations uh, in the network but in the um, literature review in most of the studies they measure them by the number of papers they publish and um, the literature review believes that they have extensive networks of connection that um, this extensive network of connection enable them to access uh, the updated and fresh knowledge so they can really boost the productivity of the network and they may have a, a positive effect on the knowledge and, uh, flow um, and so they have a um, significant contribution uh, to the success of the firms and organizations. And also there are uh, the other groups of the critical actors that we name them highly cited by authors. We count them by the number of citations in their resume. And uh, also the literature review believes that uh, they could act as a knowledge circulation improvers in the scientific network. 
And here is the loyal scientist I mentioned earlier that they prefer to collaborate with their previous partners. And in our network, we define them by the uh, weight of the edges. And, and uh, when this weight of the edge is higher than uh, one, uh, we can consider them as a loyal scientist. And um, also the studies, the previous studies believe that they can create a strong bond and enhance the network uh, efficiency. And uh, also, uh, there are some studies that believe that uh, because the, their study uh, is based on their preferences with their previous collaborators, they can have a ne negative impact on the quality of the invention produ uh, produced because the lack of diversity in their collaboration um, may have some um, negative effect on the, um, the quality of the innovations. And here is, uh, is the group of the embedded scientists. Uh, this group prefer to collaborate in a cluster. They have high tendency to collaborate in a cluster, um, cluster and deeply involved in a local network of collaboration. And you see, for example, in the um, figure A, in the left uh, side of this slide that uh, all the nodes have um, the high tendency to have the collaboration in the cluster and they are the embedded scientists uh, and also there are some studies that believes that these embedded scientists may discourage the knowledge transmission within the network because they just only wanted to deeply involve in a local network of connection and they may discourage the knowledge transmission within the entire network. And uh, also here is um, the, uh, the groups, we named them uh, science technology interactors. Um, their definition is somehow different um, with uh, the other groups. We, the other groups, we define them by their network properties, but for this group, uh, we extracted uh, the two, we, uh, we have to extract uh, the two different data sets, one for patent and one for paper and then extract the similar individuals based on them. And uh, these similar individuals are those who connect uh, the domains of science and technology together. As you see in the picture, these uh, green nodes are the science technology interactors who, who act as a gatekeeper or who, as, as a, um, who are creating a bridge between uh, the networks of scientists and networks of the inventors those um, red and yellow uh, notes. And the literature, there are too many literature review uh, that investigated their roles and also they have implemented uh, different kinds of methodologies to track their investigation, like um, they have done uh, author inventor linkage or uh, they have tracked a uh, patent citation or they have implemented topic modeling um to investigate uh, their roles and find them in the network and uh, so based on these um previous researchers we found that the existing um, literature seems to have the lack of sufficient attention to the pre preferences of the individuals when they select their collaborators in a scientific network. And also the other notable gap in the previous study is the limited investigation into the impact of the individuals on the network productivity when we consider all of them together. And also there is a need uh, to explore uh, the behavior of these individuals in their interactions with the others, or, or we can um, uh, investigate their influence um, on the dynamical social network or on the outcomes of the network. Uh, for the methodology part, um, here is the first section. The first part was uh, extracting the data set. Uh, we extracted two different data sets, one for publications and the other one for the patents. And they were both uh, AI related um, data sets. Um, I mean that uh, we implemented the same AI uh, related queries for both of them in the same time interval. Uh, between 2012 to 2019. But for the publication, we extracted the data set from Elsevier Scoopers online database and the patent um, data set extracted from the Web of Science. And so at the end, uh, we have um, 41,000 publications and about 98,000 patents.
for our investigation. And uh, here is um, the um, big picture of uh, the methodology part. Um, we can divide them to two main steps. The first step uh, was um, extracting data set and then um, do some pre-processing and cleaning and technicals, uh, create the author based data frame, and then um, calculate uh, the network properties for each authors. I mentioned earlier that uh, by these uh, network properties, we can define the critical actors like between the centrality, degree, clustering coefficient. And also we applied the CPU parallel computation uh, to overcome with the model, uh, with the runtime, the large runtime. And uh, for uh, defining the science technology interactors, uh, we extracted the same individuals uh, from the patent and paper data sets. And uh, after that, we have done some entity matching to make sure that they have some unique IDs and um, these individuals are those science technology interactors we were looking for. And the second part of this study or the main core of this study is um, developing the agent-based model using a Python pro programming language. It's, it was a modular uh, design. And uh, we create the author networks um, when the nodes represents the authors and the edges among them um, forms their collaboration. And for each node, uh, we calculate uh, the prob probabilities and define um, if they belong to each group of the critical actors. So we label them in our um, model. And we label them if they belong, for example, to the groups of critical actors, the star scientists, and meta scientists. And then uh, we consider the activated ratio uh, for each model iteration. And um, this activated ratio now can make uh, the collaboration in during the model iteration based on some partnership strategies. I will explain every detail later. And also, um, these activated men um, collaborate uh, with their previous partners or um, with the critical actors based on that partnership strategies. At the end of the story, we have a model that can simulate the network performances in the different scenarios we have defined for it. And here is a brief uh, description about the agent-based model. Agent-based model is a computer modeling of individual entities uh, or independent entities that uh, with heterogeneous characteristics and dynamical behavior. And um, we, uh, we, we have used these uh, types of simulation uh, for a study because uh, we are um, trying to have some accurate assessment about the um, dynamicals and social network of collaboration. And in this uh, network of co collaboration, we have some individuals, they act based on their characteristics and they have some different behaviors and we can observe them over the time interval. So uh, the, the best way to understand um, the effect of these behaviors and these different characteristics on the model output or on the network structure uh, is simulating them by the HM-based model. And here is the flowchart that explain um, the structure of this agent-based model. Um, after creating the agent, uh, the author-based uh, data frame and uh, defining uh, if the nodes belong to each group of critical actors, uh, we randomly selected them uh, based on some activated, um, based on some um, activation ratio, and then um, we um, run the model. Uh, at, the, at the beginning of each model runtime, all the nodes have the idle states, and then uh, these uh, randomly activated nodes can make collaborate with the other nodes based on some partnership strategies I will explain later. And I have to mention that we had some input values calculated by machine learning uh, or logistic regression algorithm. Um, be, uh, we used machine learning uh, to calculate the probabilities of these partnership strategies. And after uh, each model runtime, 
and the new uh, collaborations uh, created a new network. So we need to redefine everything. We need to calculate each node's pro uh, pro um, properties again and define uh, who belongs to each groups of the critical actors again. Everything uh, will be different. Um, and for the machine learning part, um, we have done um, a create. Uh, we have created uh, the author based data frame, and then we have built uh, the social network by not networking in Python. And then uh, we define that if the collaborators of each nodes it belongs to the groups of the critical actors, and we label them. And um, for for the logistic regression part, uh, the test site was 30 percent, and we stratified it on the label column. And also to overcome the in, the imbalanced data set, or we implemented uh, um, we applied uh, the syn the synthetic minority over sampling technicals. And here you see the model, the list of the model parameters. Uh, we have some parameters that belongs to the node's identification and status, like the node ID. It comes from the unique uh, author IDs uh, extracted from a scopus, and also we investigate if the node belongs to each of these uh, groups of the critical actors, and uh, so that uh, we label their status in the network. And um, then um, for the partnership strategies, uh, we consider uh, these parameters if um, a node had a previous collaborators um, and also um, uh, we, we have calculated the probabilities of all of these uh, partnership strategies by logistic regression, but um, they are included in the uh, in our model, uh, when uh, activated node uh, try to choose uh, his or her next collaborator, um, considering um, the collaborators belonging to the group of the critical actors, their geography, their affiliation to the university or organization, team size, um, gender, ethnicity, academic age, and the research area. And for the agent-based model, we have some more parameters like uh, the maximum partner that each activated node can could have in each model runtime, and also the activation ratio that we have defined these two based on the statistical analysis. And here's our the research question we try to solve in the rest of the presentation and in our studies. Uh, first of all, we try to solve how to define the critical actors in the research um, partnership and what are the importance of these critical actors in the scientific performance and outcomes of these research collaborations. And uh, what is the critical ac uh, actors tendency of researchers to engage in collaboration with other groups of the critical actors? And if their presence or absence or their characteristics can have some impact on the scientific network performance and also how to predict the future of the network performance, how to predict the number of collaboration in the future. And here you see the model interface and how these activated nodes collaborate with other based on those partnership strategies. And as the model keep uh, the history of the collaboration in itself, the model is going to be denser after each step, after a few steps. And here you see only the sample because um, our model, they're based on the real data set is too crowded and we cannot show them. So it is only a sample. Uh, to answer the first research question, identification of critical actors, um, I have to mention that um, uh, three groups of the critical actors like science technology interactors or most cited by authors or repeated collaborators, they have a very clear definition and uh, we didn't have any challenge uh, to define them, but uh, we had some challenges 
uh, for the rest of uh, for to define the rest of group of the critical actors like gatekeepers, the star scientists, and embedded scientists, uh, because based on the, li the literature review, we had um, different percentages, top percent, top ratio, uh, to define them in the entire network. So we implemented some analysis to make sure which percentages um, is a good fit for our databases and our study. Uh, we first uh, analyze, um, have um, some analysis, a statistical analysis over the distribution of the network properties like betweenness centrality. And you see only small numbers of authors have the betweenness centrality higher than zero, and we can consider them, consider them as the gatekeeper. Uh, but for um, the degree centrality or the number of degree, we have too many values. And we um, actually, the top ratio is very important. Uh, to define these uh, star scientists. And uh, for the clustering coefficient, um, most of the authors prefer uh, have uh, the clustering coefficient equal to one and they have the highest uh, high tendency to collaborate in a cluster. And so that the roles of the embedded scientists is transferring among the nodes and um, most of the nodes in our uh, network prefer uh, to collaborate in a cluster. And also I have brought a distribution of the science technology interactors in our um, scientific uh, network. And you see that um, these uh, similar individuals have extracted from our patent and paper data set. They have higher ratio on the, two, on the year 2019. Uh, so um, because of that, uh, we, um, run the model only on this year, 2090, because we had a better ratio of the science technology interactors and we could better see their impact um, on our um, model as, uh, output. And uh, also to uh, define that um, top ratio, uh, we investigate our um, the recall um, value we retrieved from the logistic regression. Uh, model and um, we define three scenarios collaborating with the star scientists, gatekeepers, and embedded scientists. And then we investigated the recall values for them. Uh, if we consider, um, if we compare the recall value and the, accu the accuracy, uh, we see that for our model, after uh, the five persons, we can better rely on trust our um, predictions and our calculations. And also, I have to mention that the accuracy means the number of correct prediction per total number of prediction. And the recall means the true positive per total number of true positive plus false negative. Uh, also to investigate uh, that which um, percentage is better for our study, uh, we uh, you see that we have plotted the model output, the agent-based model output for each uh, ratio. When we, for example, define the critical actors by top 1% or by 5 type percent, then you see that when we define them, sorry, when we when we define them by top uh, five percent, it demonstrates a significant impact compared to other ratios. And also based on the literature review, we cannot define the higher ratio than five percent is not logical. Uh, so uh, we will keep uh, the rest of the calculation by this um, ratio. And here is, uh, you see that uh, the rest of the research question, the importance of the critical actors on the model performance, or if their presence, absence, or characteristics can impact the network uh, performance. To uh, solve these um, research uh, questions, um, we have defined a few uh, scenarios. Um, we have defined uh, the scenarios when all the nodes are active in each model uh, iteration and when the rest of scenarios are in the presence of all others but in the absence of one groups of the critical actors. Also, we have defined uh, a scenario when we randomly chosen the authors without considering their belonging to each group of critical actors. 
And then uh, we have plotted the model output for each scenario. And you see, for example, in the absence of um, the gatekeepers, that blue, that green colors in the bottom of our uh, figure, and um, the orange color uh, embedded um, scientists, they had the highest impact when they removed them uh, from the um, agents in a model runtime. And here, as the model performance, as an indicator of the model performance, we counted the number of the new collaborations. And also when uh, we counted the number of all collaborations, including the repeated collaborations in, as the model performance indicator, uh, we had the same results. So uh, these results shows uh, that the gatekeepers have the highest impact on the, non, the, on the network productivity. And also the embedded scientists, they had the highest impact uh, and the same as the gatekeepers. But I mentioned earlier that in our network, most of the nodes prefer to collaborate in a cluster. So uh, we cannot consider them as only um, um, a minor group of the critical actors and so it, it could be ex ex um, we can expect it that they have a high impact but for the other groups of the critical actors like the star scientists uh, we had a high impact it, it goes after the gatekeepers and uh, for the most uh, cited by authors we had the same effect um, when we remove the nodes randomly from our uh, models and for the science technology interactors, actually, we didn't have any high impact uh, because um, based on the literature review, these individuals have a higher central roles in the patents collaboration network, not here in the scientific collaboration network. So we could expect this result. And uh, for the other uh, research question is uh, the collaboration tendency uh, to choose the um, collaborators among the groups of the critical actors. And uh, to do that, uh, we first investigate the number of states that have been occupied by the different roles in our uh, agent-based model. And you see um, these number of states for the gatekeepers and star scientists are same but for the embedded scientists is increasing. And it means that uh, the roles of the sci star scientists and gatekeepers have been occupied by the same individuals in each model runtime, but these ro the roles of the embedded scientists is transferring among the nodes, it is not uh, been occupied by the same individuals. And here you see the probabilities uh, of a collaboration with a star scientist, and uh, we have only two value. Um, that the value is equal to one is belongs to only m minor uh, nodes in our networks. And when we uh, when we investigate their status in our networks, we found that they are a star scientists. So the star scientists prefer to collaborate with their peers, with their star scientists, with high probability. But uh, for the other groups of critical actors, like the embedded scientists or like the gatekeepers, we have two, two values for the probabilities. And here, uh, after doing some statistical analysis, um, we uh, found the orders um, of the priority of choosing um, the collaborators and their, their percentage in each groups of uh, the scientists. Uh, for the ordinary uh, authors, um, you see, if we, uh, if we exclude the ordinary authors and we only focus on the gatekeepers, we see that for the ordinary authors, their number one priority is um, are the star scientists. And also for the science technology interactors, these number one priority are star scientists and gatekeeper with the same percentage and um, also for the most cited by authors, um, a star scientist and most cited by authors are their first priority to choose their uh, collaboration collaborators. And for the star scientists, as I mentioned earlier, they have the high tendency to collaborate with uh, their peers and with their star scientists. And here you see that for the gatekeepers, their number one uh, is star scientists, the same as the others. So um, after investigating 
all these pie charts, um, the big conclusion is that, that all groups of uh, the critical actors and also the ordinary authors prefer to collaborate with their star scientists. It is their number one priority for their collaboration. And here you see the prediction of the network performance in the future. Uh, we have done this to calculate the number of accumulated collaboration per year, because each one of the steps represent a year for each scenario. To do that, we have fitted a quadratic regression to logarithm of the number of edges for different critical actors. Uh, ratio and we validate it by the existing data set and uh, then we run it through the different scenarios to extract more fuel formula. And uh, here you see this uh, fixed value uh, for each scenario that we can use for our formula uh, to calculate the entire number of collaboration in each year. And this is for the rest of the scenarios when, for example, we considered uh, the critical actors uh, by top five uh, ratio. And here also this is the formula and um, the constant value. And also this is a step uh, that represents the model year each year. And um, we can calculate the number, the logarithm of uh, number of accumulated uh, collaboration per each model iteration. Uh, so, uh, our main conclusions, um, first of all, I have to mention that this is the first time the um, study that, that simulated the all scientists and um, science technology critical actors together um, in an agent-based model. And also, we have extracted a formula for building this and network performance in the future or the number of their collaboration. And we concluded that uh, the gatekeepers and the star scientists, they have the highest impact on the model productivity. And the model shows there is no significant impact um, from the science technology interactors on the scientific productivity in the network. And it could be uh, because uh, they have, based on the literature review, they have uh, the more central role on the patent collaboration network. They prefer uh, to be active in publishing patents rather than papers. And so astral scientists and gatekeepers are occupied by the same, these roles are occupied by the same individuals in our network, but for example, the roles of the embedded scientists is transferring among the nodes. And the majority of authors prefer to collaborate in a cluster uh, in our network, and uh, also they prefer to collaborate with the star scientists as their next collaborator. Uh, so the future steps or the following works of this study would be considering um, the other partnership strategies like uh, the authors belonging to the geography, their affiliation, team size, gender, and also extract the prediction formula for each of these mentioned scenarios and also implement other technicals to investigate and the science technology interactors like um, the patent citation or like topic modeling rather than other inventors link that we have implemented. And also we can combine the patent collaboration network with scientific collaboration network and we can have a multi-agent model at the end, uh, which is more complex and we, it can uh, be more close to the reality. And also we can use the machine learning to assist the simulation. And um, uh, it was my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. It was a uh, uh, massa really interesting presentation. Thank you very uh, much. So well done. I probably have some questions behind, but I will leave the floor uh, to Dr. Uh, Shefarova and then to the other. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mahsa, for the presentation. So I think Mahsa made it uh, kind of clear how we're working on the model and uh, the parts, and she went a lot into the details of the critical actors. And I wanted just to elaborate on the fact that it is not, uh, I mean, this is the, the first study which we are were doing with this model, uh, the studying of critical uh, 
actors, but we want to go further. So I wanted to just show some future directions, what, what we can actually do more with this model. So as she uh, explained, the, the model is trying to replicate the reality. So we are trying to take all the data, all the data which we are putting into the model are the ones which we observe in reality. So we are trying to have the model, to have the actors which have exactly the same behavior in re as in reality, right? So uh, we are simulating the reality and now we are trying uh, to play with it, right? So the future is that uh, we want to investigate various situations, various phenomena, various characteristics by simply like changing uh, some parameters in the model and see what is the effect on the collaboration of the actors or on the performance of the actors or performance uh, of the model as a whole. Like, uh, as an example, uh, for example, we want to work with funding funding for each author, this is some information which we have. So we can uh, input it and we can see the behavior. And then we can study various uh, funding strategies. Okay, we say, let's say we will give uh, more money to star scientists and uh, what it will do with the system. Uh, so we, we can observe that. Or we will give money, much more money to junior scientists, right? They still didn't show what they can do, but they have more energy, maybe they will, uh, you know, uh, fuel the system somehow, or we will give everybody the same amount of uh, funding. So we, we can study various strategies and uh, see what it will do with the system, with the agents, uh, how they will collaborate, how they will produce papers, and how the system will behave. And this is an example, we can study other things like, let's say, related to collaboration, uh, for example, gender, you know, if we create more uh, teams which are uh, multi-gender, you know, like, uh, or we have teams which are males only and females only, what is it going to do with the system? Or we will increase the number of uh, multidisciplinary scenes, uh, teams working with various disciplines or teams working in, in various geographical locations uh, and, and so on. So we can play with various parameters and see how it uh, influences the ecosystem, how it influences the actors, collaboration and performance. And based on that, we can evaluate various strategies and uh, see and um, just derive the policy implications in the end. So this is, I just wanted to make a big picture for what, what we are doing and we are still building the platform and this is our first, uh, the critical actors are, uh, is our first uh, study based on this pl platform. The platform is far from per perfect still, but we are going there. But now Dr. Abadi, I think he will talk more about the technical part, which uh, he's collaborating with FAFSA and uh, uh, he's her co-supervisor, so uh, he's more, uh, aware of these things. So, that's my input. Yes, thanks a lot, Thanks myself for the wonderful presentation. So, maybe I can elaborate a bit on the technical roadmap and uh, um, basically how machine learning and that can has context. So, in a sense, like machine learning and simulation, they we can say that they have a similar goal in, in this context, right, which is to predict the behavior of the system um, using data analysis and mathematical modeling. So, the, 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 the good news is that, like, we have a lot of um, digital data available thanks to the um, recent uh, advancement on the, the digital data side. And also we have modern computer science algorithms in hand. So these two together can introduce, let's say, new opportunities for advanced analytics. So um, for, for this specific problem, problem, there are different ways uh, in which we can use machine learning and uh, combine it with simulation to enhance the performance of the simulation results. So I, I and I'm gonna just give you some examples and th these would be some, uh, some of our uh, directions for the future research to, 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 to see which one would be the, the, the most beneficial one to boost the performance in this specific problem. So one, one way to use uh, machine learning is that to use it as a surrogate model. So basically you can use machine learning models to act and approximate 
uh, complex uh, simulations. So instead of running, Mass also mentioned that running simulations in, um, on, on large data sets, and they're often like computationally really ex expensive. So in this scenario, instead of running those uh, computationally expensive simulations, repeatedly you can use a surrogate model, which is a machine learning model, and then uh, um, um, and basically that, that model is trained on the simulation data to provide quick and accurate approximation. So that's one way to use machine learning in this scenario. The other one is um, to use machine learning for data-driven calibration. So basically, as you know better than me, like simulation models often require calibration to match the real-world uh, observations or experimental data. So we can use machine learning models to automate and enhance the calibration process. So basically by analyzing the discrepancies between simulation outputs and observed data, you can use that machine learning model to, uh, to adjust simulation parameters. So that's another way to use machine learning in this scenario. Um, the third one, which is slightly touched on in this per presentation, is to use machine learning for uncertainty quantification. Uh, Maso mentioned that she used machine learning to um, to, to to basically um, 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 predict those cutoffs for the for the uh, strategies. So we know that uncertainty is inherent in simulation uh, models um, be because of different model, uh, different different reasons. So in this sense, we can use machine learning to quantify and propagate uncertainties in simulation. Um, because we can we can somehow train that machine learning model on the historical simulation data and the uh, um, and, and the associated uh, uncertainties, and then that algorithm can provide probabilistic predictions and confidence intervals for simulation re uh, outputs. So this is sort of similar to what we saw in in some parts of this presentation. Uh, the fourth one, which in my in my opinion is the most promising uh, uh, direction. Uh, is to use um, reinforcement learning um, and, and basically reinforcement learning you can use that to optimize simulation control policies um, so in a sense we can use those techniques uh, to, to for simulation control and then by uh, formulating the simulation control as a reinforcement learning problem the algorithm can learn to make decisions or adjust parameters in real uh, in real time like uh, to maximize a specific given objective and uh, last not least like um, we all we all know about the difficulties and on the data side and if the data is not good the no matter what the model is then you cannot get uh, high quality outputs so you can uh, use machine learning and deep learning techniques uh, to augment data and to, to pre-process data uh, so we can uh, you can even use them to, to generate synthetic data, which can be used to increase, for example, the diversity and size of the training set and, and ultimately to uh, boost the performance of the simulation model. So one thing to mention is that yeah, there, there, there are a lot of possibilities and definitely it's, uh, it's an interesting research uh, to, to see which one gonna be the best for this specific problem. But the choice of appropriate combination of machine learning and simulation technique is the key because um, it, it depends on the, on the domain, on the data that is available, computational resources, and many other factors. Um, so I'm going to stop right here, but uh, I'm, I'm very excited to be part of this project. Well, thank you, Dr. Embadi. Uh, it's an interesting uh, intervention that you have both. Uh, I can. I have two or three questions. Can I? Can I? Can I make them? Then we will end like five minutes. Then, uh, so let me organize my idea because I have more than two or three. But I just want to select. Uh, so probably I will start from this. Uh, look, can you, uh, uh, Masa, clarify a little bit? The concept of critical, you have probably already done, but you know, just if you can develop it a little more, the concept of critical actors. So what is a critical actors for you? And then uh, more detail of how you identify it. What I understood is that you use logistic regression to identify critical actors. I just want to understand what did happen, how, how you, you did that, 
and then related to to this uh the machine learning which is implied right now it is related to the logistic regression or and out or there are other techniques yes. so this is the the first yes uh for the for your first question about uh what uh, the critical actors means to me uh if i got the point correctly uh these critical actors are defining based on their network properties and uh, I mentioned it during my presentation, for example, based on the network pr properties like betweenness, centrality, their degree. But in, in reality, it means that, uh, for example, gatekeepers means the one, the, the individuals who uh, connect different, different research groups to each other, different individuals to other. In the reality, means uh, those authors uh, who acts as the intermediaries between the individuals and research group and entities. So they are a connector of these groups together so they can have some high impact on the knowledge flow. Uh, so we define them based on their betweenness centrality in the network and in our calculation. And um, actually they could have some uh, good impact on the knowledge flow because they are connecting these groups and individuals together and um they, they they have some uh, differences by um, um ordinary authors ordinary authors only publish a paper maybe once in their um like career lifetime or maybe because uh, they they had to do this uh, for example to be graduated uh, but uh, these individuals like gatekeepers like uh, star scientists and they uh, have some high impact on the knowledge flow some real impact on the knowledge flow uh, so uh, we just wanted to find them in this study and uh, measure their impact and uh, then see who is the most important actor and what is the tendency of the other actors to these groups of the critical actors and also some this study shows that um this is at uh, this is um these critical actors that like for example SR scientists who all uh, the authors prefer to collaborate with because um they are very popular among the authors they have too many connections uh, so if for example they choose them as their collaborators um they um could be very popular or their articles will be seen in the world uh, there are too many reasons behind that they choose these SR scientists as their collaborators and they really want to work with them. And uh, about uh, your question about the machine learning part, um, maybe I, I didn't explain everything uh, clearly, that my the main core of this study is the agent-based model, is not the machine learning, uh, machine learning just assist us uh, to do some calculation about the probabilities. Um, the the agent based model is based on the genetic algorithm. Maybe we can consider it as one of the machine learning technical, but in, the name is agent based model and it is simulation. But uh, in, during the agent based model, when um, a, no, a node becomes randomly activated, it has to choose uh, his or her partnership strategies. But the probabilities play very important role here. What are those probabilities to choose um, the other groups or the other collaborators? So to calculate these probabilities, uh, we implemented a logistic regression and logistic regression was the only algorithm that uh, we applied as one of the machine learning algorithm in our studies. And as Dr. Ebody mentioned, uh, we want uh, to do further with machine learning and we want to involve it uh, more in our study. But at this stage, we only used it uh, to assist us for some calculations, for some model parameters. Yeah, I, I yes. understand the well now. Uh, perfect. Thank you for your answer. I just have probably one more uh, because I find interesting the fact that this model of simulation can not uh, really be used by policemaker or other people. Out Dr. Shefarova uh, underlined before, uh, you can change some parameters to see what happened. And uh, so you can, in some extent, predict your financing strategy. If you are, uh, I don't know, the, the, uh, a financing uh, a government that finance research or, so, or other stuff. So it's really interesting. And, uh, but so 
I understand this part. So you have to develop more. I understand there is the gender part and other features that probably can have an impact on the, on the model. I'm... So the, the, the two questions that I have in this sense is, uh, your model, does your model uh, consider new, new uh, individual that can came you know, in uh, two, three, four years, can came up new actor that, that joined the network? And how hard is it to do it if uh, right now you does not consider it? And does the individual change their role? So does an individual can be, uh, you know, uh, embedded uh, scientist that became a, a, a gatekeeper and a critical actor after, or, or you know, the individual can change their role? Have you, have you seen it or, or not? An individual uh, keep the same role for uh, all the simulation. Okay. Uh, if I get the point correctly, uh, for um, joining those uh, new authors in our uh, network, I have to mention that the first model iteration um, is created based on the real data set. And uh, we extracted only one year of the data set in 2019. I mentioned it briefly in my uh, presentation. And we only use that, and then uh, the models uh, keeps running based on that. So uh, the initial um, the initial information comes from the real data set, but the rest of it will be based on the simulation and those uh, model parameters. Uh, at this stage, uh, we we have not considered this scenario that um, new authors or junior authors uh, come, someone leave the model. But if we also if we consider this scenario too, the number of nodes will be constant because we always have someone comes in and someone comes out and the numbers of these nodes is uh, could be if we take an average number in a few years we see that they are constant and so that this model uh, reads some constant nodes that comes uh, first from this real data set and then the model um, keeps running uh, based on the model parameters and do the simulation but we can add it in the future it is in our schedule to add a um, few scenarios that is based on um, joining and leaving this new nodes uh, or authors and uh, sorry, what was your second question exactly? Could you explain it again? But if an individual, if an individual can change his role, uh, can yes, the individual can change his role. Um, actually, in the first model iteration, we define their role based on their network properties. But after each model runtime, um, all the network properties are different. Uh, so we need to redefine them. And uh, so, for example, if a node belongs to the group of the star scientists, now maybe it doesn't belong to the, 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 uh, the groups of the star scientists anymore, or maybe it belongs again. Um, so the, the roles can change. Yes. Yeah, I, I was made this, this question because it can be interesting to see, for example, I don't know, how a, uh, an individual be, became a star scientist, and if there is some, no individual that enhance uh, the process that somebody with the with their collaboration that somebody became a star scientist I can, this can be or star scientist or another another role that can be interesting to see i have probably a last point uh, because i find it really interesting what dr ebony said before about the reinforcement learning uh, I'm not sure that our public is familiar with this concept, but some of them, yes. So how, how I can see it is that using reinforcement learning, essentially, uh, we should be able to, to, you know, learn a model, a simulating model that is more uh, accurate, accurate because we give some review to the model when it does good. We did good, but with real data. So our review is is came from real, from real. Can you or you, Maza or Doctor uh, Ebadi, develop a little more on this possibility that I uh, I think is really promising. 
Sure, I can take that, Master, if you want. <laughs> okay, yeah, thanks for the question. So the idea here is that to capture more complex um, situations, like the one that you mentioned, like changing role, for example, that that's one thing. And the other thing is that now in this uh, in this data set, even in the current state, we have two different types of agents interacting, right? So we have researchers on one side, you have inventors on the other side. So these are the things that opens up the uh, possibility for considering reinforcement learning. And uh, sorry for not uh, explaining that uh, because I try to be super quick to uh, speak the time, but um, for re reinforcement learning, basically you can consider that as a simulation method. But in this in this scenario, like, uh, we have agents that become intelligent. So in, in a sense that they can create new optimal behaviors based on the previously defined structure for the, uh, for the rewards. So you can have uh, different types of rewards for different, and that, that's the kind of concept of multi-agent reinforcement learning, where they have different type of agents, you, they, they can work on or uh, get motivated or get uh, stimulated by different types of rewards and then you can you can just imagine how complex behaviors um, you can capture with this sort of environment where you have some different agents uh, trying to maximize different types of rewards and then interacting with that environment i hope i uh, address your question in a very brief manner but i would be happy to take it off offline if any of the audience they they want to know more about this part of the research or if they see any um, any opportunities for collaboration we would be happy to uh, to be in touch and yeah talk off <laughs> dr shivarva you want you want to add anything yeah not about the reinforcement no thank you okay well Thank you. I, I, it was really, really a good session, and I enjoyed to hear you. And it's a promising, uh, promising uh, work. But it's already, oh, it's already interesting how you did until now. Thank so, you. for me, for me is all. Uh, I'm not sure, Martin. Do we have something from public, from the audience here, or or not? No, no, no questions from the public. So the most of the people will uh, listen uh, in uh, offline. So I thank you to everybody. So I just want to mention to the audience that if you want more detail, you can write, uh, you, can, you can contact the authors by, by mail. So how Dr. Ebadi said is really open to even collaborate with, uh, with him if, if you want. So I really thank you. I really thank you to Madame Shifarova, to Dr. Shifarova, uh, that uh, allowed this uh, session today, and to uh, Dr. Ebadi and uh, Nori Nagafi. I'm sorry for the, for the pronunciation. So thank you, and uh, have a good uh, have a good afternoon. Thanks so much. Thank you for having us here. Hi. Thank you very much.